over the world. During the day number one, Elliot, Raphael, Lawrence, along with Rajan and Alexandra, have been talking about EFG topic, showing us financial, legal, technology platform uh, uh, ideas, and it was very interesting. Second day was also very interesting, very inspiring, with Nadia, with Maria, with Alexandra, and with Thiago from the middle of the Amazonia. And you have been talking about uh, the intersection of technology tool and environmental issues. I also would like to warmly thank all the people working on the Green Week for more than two months. Of course, uh, Alexandra Gamboa, thank you for coordinating. But I also would like to thank uh, Emma, Miha, Om, Janavi, Lisa, and Maduli to, to work uh, behind, behind the walls. And your work is very important. That's why also I would like to share this number of success that between one half million and one million of people all over the world have been impacted by our uh, uh, social media and by our uh, previous events during the Green Week, which is very important, taking into account uh, the complexity of, of the topic. So today, this is our last time together, but uh, I can already say that next time, I hope we will make it not uh, with the Zoom, but maybe in Amazonia, maybe in Brazil, all together. And uh, today we will talk about policy and governance with Alexandra, with Maria as moderator, and uh, Vice, Pierre, Enrique, Anna are joining us. But Nadia, you are also welcome to, to, join this, uh, to join this conversation. So once again, thank you. I already know that I will learn today and I will enjoy this, uh, this experience. One last word, I would like to say that uh, what you have been sharing with us was more than ideas, new models or proposal. It was also something very personal uh, about what you believe, about your expectations. And I would like to, to thank each of you for that. Um, Nadia and Maria, the floor is yours for the day number three. Thank you. Hi everyone, and thank you again for joining us um, today. And thanks to everyone who has actually been joining us this whole week. Um, indeed, um, I echo upon it has been such an enriching um, conversation this whole week. And uh, me personally, I myself have learned so much from all the speakers that we've had on since um, we started these series of webinar sep webinars. So again, welcome to the last day of Berkeley Global Society's Green Week. I am Alex Sandra Gamboa, an environmental and energy lawyer, and I will be again your host for today. So again, before we start this webinar, just a few information for our audience. This is being recorded um, and will be simulcasted on Berkeley Global Society's YouTube page. And this will also the recording will also be available after today's webinar in the same um, YouTube page. So um, Berkeley Global Society is the alumni organization of the UC Berkeley College of Law. And uh, we decided to host this webinar because um, Berkeley Global Society is a leading um, international organization, always seeks to have the goal of starting and fostering discussions and collaborations to address important global issues. And because of this, and uh, knowing that in re recent years, conversations about uh, the detrimental effects of our um, treatment of the environment has been consistently um, talked about, and the effects have been felt globally with um, government and economies seeing that the risks that they were being exposed to because of this environmental degradation has already been going higher and higher and then um, it has caused um, a lot of um, inequality as well as um, worsening uh, the rates of poverty and hunger because of this inaccessibility of resources globally due to the dwindling resource of um, environmental resources. So because of this, Berkeley Global Society, this Society decided to host this series of webinars to provide a venue for all of us to talk about it and exchange information about um, lessons that we've learned um, and 
best practices that we've seen in environmental solutions in the hope of working towards a common goal, um, towards finding solutions for these environmental problems. Um, with this, uh, I would like to welcome all of you today to our webinar on policy and governance. And for our first speaker, I would like to introduce Vice Yu, who is the Senior Legal Advisor for the Third World Network. Um, go ahead, uh, Vice. We will be hearing from him about the international environmental law and policy and the opportunities and challenges that he sees in this space. Go ahead, Vice. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alex. And, and thank you to uh, the Berkeley Global Society for inviting me. Um, uh, you know, Alex and I have known each other for quite some time, uh, and I was uh, so glad to uh, receive the invitation. I'm not from Berkeley myself. Um, I uh, graduated from an East Coast school uh, called Georgetown in DC. And, um, and I wish we had something like this, you know, at least my, my fellow alumni, but maybe we, we don't, or they haven't gotten in touch with me yet. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, international environmental governance and sort of like the experience that I've had in, in that area. Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, maybe walk you through a PowerPoint that I made with, with some photos and some slides and all that, just to show the linkage between the, I think the international environmental governance law and diplomacy area that sort of like I've worked in for uh, most of my professional life. Um, the uh, impact it has had, uh, perhaps in terms of the um, treaty regimes that we now have, and and then the, as, as Alex was saying, the uh, opportunities and challenges that we we uh, we we see in that area. Um, just a, a quick background uh, in terms of my work, I've been uh, like Alexandra, um, an environmental and trade lawyer mostly. Um, I've uh, been working uh, with developing country governments uh, for most of my professional life uh, and um, providing advice and, and policy support and, and uh, technical assistance. And at least in the context of the climate change negotiations, I've also been a negotiator in that area, including uh, negotiating uh, during the Paris Agreement uh, negotiations. So maybe let me present uh, my slide and then I'll, I'll, I'll try to go through it as quickly as I can uh, so that we can then have a good presentation. So I asked Alex to give me three, uh, to give me some guide questions. So what uh, she sent to me essentially was, you know, what is the role of international policy and governance in finding environmental solutions? Then uh, she asked me uh, what uh, has been the uh, areas of international environmental governance that I have worked in. And, and, and then third was the opportunities and challenges. Um, let, let me see if uh, this can start up. Um, okay, uh, can you see the slideshow? Yes. Yeah, go, okay. We can so, see it. Uh, yeah, so um, I, I often like to think of international environmental policy in, in sort of like three distinct but interrelated areas, right? So one is international environmental governance, which is this big um, overarching complex of organizations, instruments, financing, rules, procedures, norms that sort of like shape how governments uh, undertake uh, environmental conversation. And then a subset of that would be international environmental law and policy, which I think for those of us who are, you know, and I think we're all lawyers here, would be that complex of rules and norms uh, that, that then shape how governance is undertaken. And then within that law and, and law and policy area is then diplomacy, which is then you know that practice and process of how we shape those laws, norms, and processes. So you know to to pursue international environmental governance. And so uh, that that kind of like Russian doll, you know, that is small doll, bigger doll, big doll uh, kind of thing. I think is is sort of like how one could see international environmental governance. And what we have seen is that over the uh, past decades, you know, we have seen uh, this growth in, in, in that regime uh, where we have seen institutions come up. Uh, for example, the UN Environment Assembly, you've got the UN Environment Program as sort of like the Secretariat, and you've got a broad range of uh, international environmental agreements, over 1,300 now, uh, covering a wide range of areas, right? And then you've got financing uh, facilities that have been put in place, like the GF, uh, the Green Climate Fund, and then you've got sort of like... Uh, a broad uh, framing uh, being set up by the United Nations through the Sustainable Development Goals. 
So what we have in terms of uh, this, this treaty arrangement is really, as I was pointing out earlier, big, uh, big uh, and, and like broad in scope. You've got those that are pertaining to the atmosphere. So you've got ozone, you've got climate, uh, those pertaining to wastes and toxics like the Basel Convention. Uh, you've got those pertaining to the you know, terrestrial uh, part of our planet, like you know the Biodiversity Convention, the Wetlands Convention, and you've got those that are pertaining to the um, oceans. Um, so you, you have a broad web of uh, international agreements, really, that sort of like in, in some ways interlink with each other, but in many ways are also very much in a silo. And that's, that would be one of the challenges I'll be pointing out later. Um, one of the main areas that I have been working on over the past at least 15 years or so uh, has been on multilateral uh, climate change negotiations. Um, I started out in that process 2005 uh, or so, uh, 2006, um, and sort of like became engaged very deeply into it beginning in 2007, 2008, up to the present. In, in, and I'll, I'll be discussing that uh, a bit shortly. And, and I think when we look at climate change negotiations and policy making, I think uh, some of these questions that I put up on the screen are really important. And, uh, and I think they are uh, the um, answer as to why we need to have multilateral climate change negotiations. Aside from the fact, of course, that climate change is an existential crisis for us, but it's really about um, asking ourselves as a global society, right? Or as national societies, um, when we look at climate change and how it impacts our societies, are we talking about systemic change? Or is, are we talking about a technology-driven solution? Are we talking about two separate things, emission reductions and adaptation? Or are we talking about both together at the same time? What is the role of the state in terms of regulating? Uh, what is the role of the markets, of capital? And what is the role of people, right? Well, how do we work together as a global community in terms of technology, in terms of finance, how do we share the burdens of addressing climate change? So all of those uh, questions go into the question, into the like overarching question of why do we need to have multilateral climate change negotiations? Um, a big part of that, and this is sort of like coming from the experience where, where I have been in the climate change negotiations as a developing country uh, government advisor and as a negotiator, a big part of the answering those questions lies in, in the next set of slides that I'm going to be showing. Uh, one is that uh, we need to address climate change because it is a big component in terms of how we address global inequality and development gaps You know that exist between developed and developing countries. And this is just a slide, I think, to show sort of like the disparity in income and wealth you know, between countries uh, where most of the world's population lie in developing countries here in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. But most of the world's wealth still remain concentrated in, in developed countries in North America and Europe and in, in, in Australia and, and uh, New Zealand. But a big another part of that, I think, question and, and sort of like the underlying um, uh, um, issues that we need to address is the fact that you have differentiated uh, and differential impacts and vulnerabilities that exist because of, of the underlying inequality and development gap that we see currently, right? So here in this map, what I've tried to show here, you know, I've just overlaid different maps coming from different sources, but it, it's quite clear that, for example, um, the, the deeper reds that you have on this map are essentially the, the, the countries where you see greater levels of either vulnerability in terms of climate or poverty in terms of, uh, in, in terms of the economic uh, conditions there or political instability in terms of the, the, the ability of the society to maintain a certain level of, of uh, st stability in, uh, in, in both their econo economy and their politics. And what this shows to us is that when you overlay uh, inequality and, and poverty on top of climate impacts, uh, for example, here on the upper left, uh, you see a greater level of vulnerability across the board in, all virtually, all, in virtually all developing countries. And I think that is a systemic issue that needs to be addressed because it is linked not only to climate change impacts as an environmental condition, but also linked to the, um, the, 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 the systemic and econom economic inequalities that we see uh, currently across the world. And it will have not only impacts in terms of 
uh, how the developed countries will do, for example, but also impacts in terms of what kinds of population movements are we going to be expecting to see over the next few decades, uh, like in this lower right, where we see, uh, for example, migration flows going from South America to North America or from Africa to Europe or from Asia to Australia, you know, largely because you have that kind of differential impact. Um, and it looks likely because not only because of the pandemic, uh, but also because of, you know, further changes in, 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 in conditions that we might see that affect how economies are, are growing or are shaped, um, that those kinds of uh, vulnerabilities or inequalities could become exacerbated over the next few decades as we live in a world that is much more climate constrained or more biodiversity constrained. Um, and then we see, for example, technology challenges, we see pandemics again coming up, we see increased, you know, uh, is the social instability that could lead to war. Uh, we might even see uh, greater levels of economic uh, recession happening also uh, over the next uh, few years or, or a couple of decades. And so um, this, I think, highlights the fact that we need to talk uh, really carefully about climate change in the context of all of these things, because climate change cannot be treated as an environmental issue. And I think, uh, and, and that has been underlying the negotiations for 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 uh, as long as there, there have been climate change negotiations since the early 90s. But things are much more urgent now. And this is coming from, for example, the IPCC's uh, report a couple of years ago, where they were saying that, you know, if we are to achieve, for example, this 1.5 degrees Celsius goal that is set in the Paris Agreement, uh, we have barely, uh, uh, you know, 20 years, uh, even less, uh, in which to achieve that, uh, the, the amount of emission reductions globally so that we do not exceed that 1.5 degrees uh, by the year 2100. Um, and it's something that came out from UNEP a couple of years ago, where they're saying that uh, in order for us to achieve uh, that level of uh, emission reductions between now and 2040, 2030, we need to have something like seven and a half percent rate of, an, of emission reductions every year globally. And that it's a very tall order because that has never happened in the past at all. Uh, it happened last year in 2020, it's something like a 7% emission reductions, but uh, most scientists are now saying that that is just a short blip, largely because of the lockdowns. Uh, once the lockdowns are finished, once we all get vaccinated and the global economy zooms up again, energy demand will go up, which means increased use of fossil fuel will again go up, which then means increased uh, emissions again all globally. You know? so, so the scale of the challenge is really big. And that is what the uh, UNFCCC and its Paris Agreement have been trying to achieve. Um, I was there uh, in the negotiations of the Paris Agreement. I was a negotiator uh, in the negotiating rooms. And, and what we were trying to achieve there was to make sure that you have a coherent multilateral treaty regime, not only in terms of the climate change convention that was, an, that was uh, adopted in 1992, uh, but also in terms of its subsidiary legal instrument, right, which is a Paris Agreement. And so the, the question was, should a Paris Agreement replace the UNFCCC or should it be enhancing the UNFCCC? And if you read the Paris Agreement carefully, what it does is it sets up not a new regime, but a complementary and enhancement regime to the UNFCCC, such that when you, when one uh, reads and implements and interprets the Paris Agreement, it has to be done in the context of what its mother treaty uh, uh, sets out to do. And so that's sort of like this kind of slide that I'm trying to show that uh, shows the relationship between the two, uh, two uh, uh, treaties. Um, and there is uh, this thing called CBDR in, in the, the, the design of the Paris Agreement. It's common but differentiated responsibility. Um, which is a key principle in the climate regime because what it highlights is the need for uh, countries to have a common responsibility to address climate change, to combat climate change together, but you have a differentiated set of responsibilities given the fact that you have uh, countries that will have be at different economic circumstances. And so the Paris regime, regime uh, the Paris Agreement being a treaty, a daughter treaty of the mother treaty, the UNFCCC, then reflects that kind of principle as well in the uh, different 
uh, in the different um, you know provisions of the Paris Agreement. And so this is sort of like what I've tried to do in mapping this, where it comes from, uh, from the convention, the, the CBDR principle, and where it then shows up in the Paris Agreement. So the uh, climate, the Paris Agreement was a hard-fought uh, set of negotiations. It took us uh, from 2011, when the uh, mandate was launched, to 2015, uh, and that was sort of like the second uh, iteration of that attempt. Because the first attempt to craft a new treaty uh, to enhance the uh, Paris Agreement, uh, the UNFCCC, in addition to the Kyoto Protocol, actually started in 2007. That first attempt did not result in a treaty uh, and was closed in 2012 and was replaced by this new process that eventually lead, led to the Paris Agreement. So it's a complex multi-factor game, international uh, climate negotiations, because you have different sets of actors there. Uh, you have actors, uh, individuals, essentially, who directly control and influence negotiations. Then you have blocks and groups. Uh, so this alphabet soup here referred to different negotiating groups that are in the climate change negotiations, such as the group of 77. You have the African group of negotiators. You have the least developed countries group. You have the small island states. You have the Arab group. You have the left-wing uh, Latin American countries in ALBA. You have the right-wing Latin American countries in ILAC. You have the uh, like-minded developing countries group that includes China and India. You have the EU. You have the umbrella group that includes the US and Australia. And you have the environment integrity group that uh, includes uh, Switzerland and Mexico. Then you have different levels of negotiations uh, as well and processes and other considerations which are actually quite important. You know, contrary to the uh, pre-World War II period where French was the uh, primary uh, English for the uh, primary uh, language for diplomacy, English has now become the uh, the uh, uh, primary language for negotiations both multilaterally as well as in the climate change, which, which then automatically disadvantage many of the non-Anglophones uh, in the negotiations. Um, the negotiations is a game of how we communicate, right? And this is sort of like a graphic that I, I, was, uh, I, I saw and I thought might be useful to sort of like highlight uh, where we are in, the, in, in, in terms of how we communicate in climate negotiations, because oftentimes um, uh, we as negotiators or as policymakers have many thoughts that we want to put into words, but we can put that only into so many words. And uh, depending on the level of articulateness, we can say that only, you know, is a smaller proportion of that. And then people actually understand you even less, right? So, so it, it's like a, a game of being as precise and as concise as you can so that people can understand as much of what you're trying to say to them as possible. And oftentimes, you know, that little that people actually understand when gets sent to the receiver um, and then the receiver uh, is, you know, gives that response, often is where you get, find this area of agreement or disagreement. And that is really the sort of like the key in international negotiations uh, where we, we try to uh, uh, deal with, with that area of agreement or disagreement. And that took a long time in the context of the Paris Agreement. For example, it took us four years to to resolve all of the areas of agreement or disagreement uh, that we were trying to get. And it is not helped by the fact that it's because it's multilateral, you have different cultural traits that go into how one negotiates, you know, a, 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 that kind of uh, international agreement, um, you know, because you have people which are either in the very individual or very time limited, time focused, you know, uh, so that most likely that generally were people from from the U.S. and you know from the from Europe, and then and then there are negotiators coming from a more uh, collectivist um, society, or where the the focus is on building relationships and on being polite and you know building relate and 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 being indirect, so that um, you are able to build trust in the negotiations rather than having an outcome in the negotiations. And then you know you have uh, people who come from polyconic cultures as well, where Time is flexible. So that often made for interesting clashes in terms of how one uh, tried to negotiate uh, where, you know, like for example, me, I, I often uh, uh, notice my colleagues on the other side of the table um, from developed countries being so conscious of the time that they wanted to get things done, bam, bam, bam. 
whereas those of us and my colleagues from Africa or from Asia and Latin America were much more, much more um, relaxed in saying, no, we don't need to, and we don't need to resolve this right now because we need to understand you better first. So, uh, and then this is how we were trying to deal with it in, in the context of the negotiations. And Alex would be familiar with this. You know, this is actually the negotiate main negotiating room in Bonn, in Germany. This is sort of like how we would negotiate in smaller groups. But what is interesting, which often is not seen in the public, is what happens at the very tail end of the conferences, of the negotiations. This is what happens, these uh, photos here, where the last minute details of this agreement um, get solved, not in terms of this kind of formal setting, but solved in terms of people actually gathering together and huddling and trying to listen to each other across small tables, you know, squeezing with each other. And, 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 uh, and what often then ends up is that the key decision makers or the key representatives of the um, negotiating groups like the EU or the US then gets um, either squeezed into or pushed into the middle of that huddle uh, for them to then resolve the, 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 whole, uh, the whole package, um, which is at least from my perspective, uh, even though I'm uh, as a negotiator, I always managed to find myself sort of like somewhere in the middle of this. Um, we, for, for those who are outside of that circle, uh, outside of that huddle, you actually don't know what's happening. And so climate negotiations at, in, at some point can be transparent, but oftentimes it also often ends up as a black box for many observers, because at the end of the day, uh, in most of the negotiations that I've had ended on climate change, it ends up like this at the last hour or last couple of hours that often then extends into one or two more days. And this is uh, even after Paris, uh, let me just, this upper left, upper uh, uh, left here was in Durban where the Paris Agreement negotiations started. The lower right here is the final one to two hours of Paris where we were uh, trying to really settle the deal. And you can see that huddling there with the EU and the US and China and India, uh, uh, you know, sort of like uh, really there in the middle. That kind of process did not stop after Paris because even after Paris, it continued as we were trying to negotiate how to implement the Paris Agreement. And even up to the last conference where we were in person uh, in Madrid um, in 2019, where we were still doing all of those kinds of huddles. But um, it's not all grim when you do climate negotiations because you do get to meet a lot of people. Uh, you get to see sunrises because you have to be in the conference room, conference center very early, but you also get to sleep on the job right here on the lower right uh, because uh, con negotiations often go very late into the night and early into the morning. Um, so you have to put it in the bucket list, right? Um, how do we negotiate during COVID now? Uh, we don't know, really. Uh, we have this conference coming up in Glasgow in the UK. Uh, we don't know what will happen, whether it will actually take place, but, uh, uh, you know, but, but that is now the question as to whether or not we will go ahead. So uh, just the last few slides. What do we see uh, as opportunities and challenges? Like I was saying, we need to deal with climate change. We need to deal with it multilaterally. We need to deal with it as an international cooperation issue. And uh, a big part of the problem is uh, here, um, there is often a lack of cooperation and coordination among uh, many of the international organizations. We see a fragmentation of the international governance system. Uh, there's often a lack of compliance uh, with an inefficient use and management of financial resources. And here at the bottom, uh, apologies, it's being hidden by the subtitling. Um, we often see um, inter-regime incoherence. Uh, you know, between, for example, what we're supposed to do on climate change versus what we're supposed to do on trade in the WTO versus what we're supposed to do in terms of international debt and biodiversity and those other things. So there's that kind of uh, regime incoherence that needs to be addressed. But uh, there are also opportunities. And as, as you know, as, as we often say uh, from Asia, in crisis, there is an opportunity. And here where we see a systemic crisis coming out from the pandemic, and from climate change, there will also be opportunities for systemic reform. And that means looking at, okay, how do we craft an integrated regime reform and coherent system uh, in 
for example, economic system in the economic system, in the climate change and biodiversity, trade, and all those kinds of things, so that we are able to deliver global public goods. And here I define global public goods in two ways. One is uh, having the global north, the developed countries lead by example in showing that emissions can in fact be reduced and that ecological footprints can in fact be reduced while maintaining quality of life and reducing inequality. And that means looking at the global north in terms of reductions in, in making lifestyle sustainable and reducing consumption levels. And the second part of the global public good argument here is how do we then pursue equitable sustainable development in the global south? And that means improving the quality of life by eradicating poverty and in an environmentally sustainable manner. Uh, so uh, not following the footsteps of the developed countries in having a fossil fuel driven, fossil fuel based uh, economy over the past uh, century, for example, but really looking at how one could leapfrog, uh, help developing countries leapfrog away from that kind of bad kind of development into a better way, more sustainable development pathway. Um, what are the priority areas for international cooperation that I see? I think uh, one is we need to look at the clean energy transition. So the shift from fossil fuels to clean and renewable energy in development is going to be important. Uh, but also important is increasing energy access in developing countries uh, by supporting them. So that means looking at financing and technology as well. Uh, um, which is which goes to the second point here, uh, which is about uh, helping developing countries achieve low emission, develop sustainable development pathways, and that means looking at economic diversification, improving endogenous technology development, and undertaking industrial transition. And uh, finally, the last point uh, here at the bottom is then how do you support clean energy, uh, clean technology transfer, so that uh, developing countries do not need to keep on buying technologies from developed countries, but are able to develop their own technologies uh, in a way that is appropriate to their uh, national systems and circumstances. So maybe let me end here. Uh, apologies for taking uh, quite a bit of time in going through that slide, uh, those slides, um, but uh, if I can uh, be of assistance in the future as well, feel free to send me an email. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vice, for that presentation. And I always, um, uh, appreciate the fact that you factor in um, each uh, country's culture in the negotiations. I feel like that's a big chunk of um, part of negotiating that we often forget about. Thank you for that, Vice. For our next uh, speaker, we've heard from Vice about how it looks like on a global international level when we talk about environmental government governance and uh, international environmental agreements as well as international environmental policies. We're zeroing in on um, Europe for our second speaker, and he will be talking about the European Green pa Package and other similar policies in Europe. Uh, may we welcome Pierre Chevillard, an associate of Atmos Avocats. Go ahead, Pierre. Thank you, Alex. Um, yeah, so I, I think this is a very good transition to Vicente. This is, we, we, we've just seen how it works globally, and I will try to provide an overview of what it is uh, at the European level, uh, the environmental law policy at the European level, but also at the French level, and, and uh, environmental policies uh, globally and, and, and more particularly um, climate policies so that, that we, can, we can talk a bit about, about uh, the, the implementation of the Paris Agreement and the UNFCCC uh, at, the, at the European level. So I will share my, my presentation. I think it would be easier for you to follow. Um, so um, I've been asked to talk about the European Green Deal. So this is like, uh, this is a new, new, um, uh, sorry. Uh, this is a new, new policy that, that is, um, uh, that will be implemented in, at, at, in the European Union uh, very soon. This, uh, this, this has been um, a, a big project for the European Commission for years. And the, the idea is to have um, uh, 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 a global policy on, on, on the environment that was 
very uh, sectoral and 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 fragmented uh, um, quite the same way that as Vicente said uh, at the at the international level was quite the same very sectoral policies and and not very integrated so uh, the idea is to have like environmental policy integrated in every kind of uh, policy at the at the European at the, the European level. Um, in consumer law, um, so it's it's a, you, you have on, on one one side like more traditional environmental policy, waste, uh, waste management, um, uh, protection of biodiversity, uh, climate change, but you have also new instrument to introduce environmental um, concerns into um, um, more um, in other kind of policies such as like consumer laws, um, consumer protections, uh, and the idea is to have like a policy, a, a, an environmental policy, more consistent and and integrated in in every in in every field um, of of the the the, the, the European ac action. Uh, so it was launched by the European Commission in December two thousand nineteen. And um, as I said, the idea is to have like a, a more integrated policy to fight against climate change and uh, biodiversity laws. So you have like in this in this scheme, you have like all the the, the policies that are uh, currently um, that the, the the Commission wants to integrate in this European New Deal. So. It is like climate change, of course. So the implementation of the Paris Agreement and the objectives of the Paris Agreement, of course. You have supplying clean, affordable, and secure energy. So energy policy is also part of the this environmental, um, this green deal, of course. You have transportation, uh, also a big part of European policy and, and competences. Um, circular economy. So this is a uh, consumer concern, how the consumers can also participate in everyday life to the protection of the environment. Um, you have uh, those uh, farm to fork. So this is also the food law policy kind of kind of a, a new new concept. Like it's it's so um, makes reduce the 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 the, the Sorry, I don't find my, my word to, to just to reduce the, the the emissions between the the, the farmers, the, the industry, and the consumer. So um, and and another sector is a toxic free environment. This is like chemical policies. This is also something that something that is um, come come came up on the on the European scene quite recently with uh, more and more concern from the public, which is the, 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 the chemical industry and, and how we protect and we inform consumer from um, on, on all the, 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 the issue with uh, chemicals. So this is all the, 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 the global um, spectra of all the, the policy that are involved in this uh, European Green Deal. And that will be implemented through a series of acts from the European Union in in the coming in the coming years. So, just to give you an overview of how it works in the European Union, um, the the environment is a shared competence. So, it's, it's the European Union is like kind of a federal state, if if you want. It's not a federal state, but it it works quite the same, meaning that there is a, a competencies that are exclusive for the European Union, other competencies that are exclusive for the state members, and some competencies that are shared between state members and the European institutions. And environment is one of them. But in practice, most of the, the, the environmental um, regulations, laws and regulation in, in France, for example, comes from Europe. I think about 70 or 80 percent of the the, the the regulation and law law that are applied in in France currently comes from uh, acts from the the EU institutions. Um, 
So this comes from the treaty on the functioning of the European European Union that like provide for the protection of of the the, the environment. This is a legal ba basis for all environmental policies and involvement of the European institutions in the making and and the in the making of environmental policies and 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 then these policies are policies are implemented in the in in each member states. So, um, Vicente, we, we're talking about all the, the international conventions on, on, the, on existing to govern the, 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 the environmental sphere. Uh, and this is quite, quite the same, this is very fragmented. Uh, it's quite the same currently in the European Union. You have a, a treaty or law regulation for uh, every kind of, of subject matter. There is no coordinated or global Low encompassing all the all the issues uh, with 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 the environment. So just uh, to give you an overview of the, the 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 most important law regarding the the, the environmental protection in in the EU, you have the uh, Directive on Industrial Emissions (IED) directive that is mostly like the emissions um, uh, authorized for the industry. Like it's mostly a permitting things, so you authorize the industry to pollute, um, to emit such um, amount of uh, substances in the air. Um, you provide um, a legal uh, framework for um, soil uh, pollutions. Uh, th this, is, this is the idea of this, um, this directive uh, on industrial, on, on the industry and, uh, and the pollution of the industry. You have the waste framework directive, which is like provide for the management of waste um, and a very, a very global um, directive, which is implemented at the national level um, to integrate all the, the particularities of, the, of, of the, 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 the member states. You have the water framework directive, which is designed to protect the, the, the consumers uh, from the pollution of, of, of from from water pollution, you have the habitats directive, which is the the, the big part of the, the the biodiversity policy at the at the European uh, at the European level with the birds directive, which provides for the protection of habitats and and species through a list of of uh, protected uh, habitat and spaces. It's quite like the uh, Endangered Species Act in the in the US. Uh, you have the Directive on Ambient Air Quality and Cleaner Air for Europe, which is designed to protect uh, the, the citizens of the European Union and from air pollution. And <clears throat> you have the Directive on um, establishing a scheme for greenhouse gas emission allowance trading within the community, which is the main directive implementing um, the UNFCCC, uh, the then Kyoto Protocol and now the Paris Agreement, which is designed to um, progressively reduce the, 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 the greenhouse gas emissions of the uh, industry and the avi aviation sector. So these uh, policies go through a var variety of policy tools, uh, regulatory standards, I was uh, talking about the, the, the EID directive, this is mostly permitting, so you permit industry to put it uh, a, a certain way with emission limits. Um, so this is like through regulatory standards, it's like top-down policies, very, very, very classic. And then you have a cap and trade system, the EU carbon market, which is the main, the major carbon market uh, currently in place in the world, which has um, been very um, difficult to put in place at the beginning with a massive fraud within the, the EU. Uh, it is now uh, in, its, it, it's in its uh, fourth phase and it's, it's, it works actually pretty well right now. Um, the price of the carbon is about uh, 40 euros right now and so the, the system is like you you have like free the industry has free allowances and can trade these allowances if 
it has uh, polluted less and and has um, allowances remaining that it can sell to other uh, players in the market, which can be other operators or a person outside the market. And, and it has proved to be quite efficient over the past few years. Um, and, and so I, I guess in the US there is a few cap and trade system, maybe a few states have such a system, but, but the European Union is, is one of the, 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 the more, um, the more um, efficient market at the time. The alternative to that is like taxes, but it's not something that the European Union can do uh, because taxes have, is an exclusive competence of the, of the member states. Um, so we don't have like carbon taxes or other kind of taxes at the European level, but member states such as France and I guess many other states have taxes related to the environment or pollution. We have a general tax on polluting activities in, in France um, and some other uh, kind of, of, of taxes to uh, give incentives to the industry to uh, pollute less or, or, or transition to, towards cleaner energy. Um, and I think this is the case in, 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 uh, in many member states. And we have contractual arrangement. This is pretty rare, but we have some directives or regulation that provide for uh, uh, contractual arrangements between member states and, and indi individual or, or legal persons uh, for the production of biodiversity, for example. You can have, uh, the states can have, uh, can conclude, um, enter into an agreement with a person to protect the biodiversity on its on um, land, uh, this is this is one of the tools that that's on that can be used as well, even if it's pretty rare. And and but it's 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 uh, in France, it's something that tends to be used more and more by the by the 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 the, author, the author, authorities to um, to um, give incentive to individuals to protect the environment. In their private um, um, in the private uh, affairs, um, part of this green deal is the European Climate Pact, um, launched very recently in December two thousand twenty, and the idea is to have something more. Um, uh, in addition to the, the, the current framework, the directive, the 2003 directive, which established the carbon market, to have something more um, uh, inclusive uh, with civil society, with more participation of the, of the public in this, in this framework, and um, having more consu consultation processes uh, to include the public in the, in the climate policy of the, of the European Union. And this uh, pact will um, induce the, 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 there is a proposal of the European Commission to have a, a law, a climate law that will be uh, probably a regulation, not a directive. And that would be, um, uh, that will fix like set targets in the law that, that are not currently set in the, in, the, in the 2003 directive. And that will, um, uh, implement at the European level the, 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 the targets that are set in the climate, the, the Paris Climate Agreement and, and in the, 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 the UNFCCC. There will be, um, so um, Vicente was talking about the, 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 the common but differentiated responsibility principle. Uh, and we can see that even in the European Union. The, of course, there is different in economic development between the, the 27 member states. Um, um, but uh, so the, the idea of the commission is to have, um, is to have uh, something that will also provide for um, financial support to the region of the of Europe that are 
uh, that have less economic uh, uh, means and to help them to achieve uh, um, the, the same outcome, but uh, like with, with the fin financial support of other, of the other member states. And I, I, I wanted to, 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 to give you also an overview of what, as, as a lawyer, what was the, the current state of the, 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 the court system, how climate uh, in, interact with, with, with the court system and, uh, and uh, what is, uh, what is um, the current status of climate action in the, in the, in the, in the, in, in Europe and, and, and in France in particular. So there, there was one climate action uh, introduced within the, the European Court of Justice very recently, uh, I mean, two years ago and, and the outcome um, uh, uh, was uh, this year. So there was like several people, several um, individuals uh, that introduce a claim um, against the European Union, um, claiming that the the, the 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 current framework, the legal framework, and in particular the, the 2003 directive, was not sufficient to um, be uh, in compliance with the uh, objective of the Paris Agreement and the UNFCC framework. Uh, so at the time, I think it was still the, the, the Kyoto Protocol, um, and the result was quite was was expected by 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 most people because um, uh, there is a case law from from the ECG on the standing of individuals, and and then the the, the court decided that uh, the the appellants are not. Um, uh, sufficient standing to uh, claim um, redress from the European Court of Justice. So the, it was it was uh, a failure of the the climate uh, uh, climate action at the um, at the at the European le level. And uh, climate justice in France has been. Uh, surprisingly more successful the past uh, over the past few years. Uh, this is surprising in the sense that uh, we are a civil law, most of the member states of, of the European Union are civil law countries. France is a civil law country and judges have not the same status uh, in civil law system that in common law system. So they are not expected to to, to provide, to, to be involved in politics. So most of the time they refuse to, to take, uh, to take um, part to political debates in particular on, on subjects that are uh, tricky such as climate change. But there are two decisions that have been rendered by, by administrative courts very, very recently that um, Show um, a change in the the mindset of the of, of the courts in France, and that they 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 use the environmental fields uh, to gain more uh, powers, and and that's quite that's quite a um, a big change in the in the in the the behavior of courts. So we have one one decisions uh, in February. Uh, three two thousand and twenty one, so very like two 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 months ago, and and so the the, the administrative court of Paris um, held that the the applicants of few associations were entitled to claim compensation in kind for the ecologic harm caused by the French government's failure to meet its greenhouse gas emissions reduction goals. We don't know how the, this, this compens compensation in kind will be um, allocated. Uh, the court must uh, issue an, another uh, decision to uh, explain how this will be put in place. But the, the principle is, 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 um, uh, has been decided that, that the, this failure to um, meet uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions goals is an ecological harm caused by France to um, 
these these associations. So that that's that's quite a landmark case because we we didn't think that such uh, such decision was possible in a in a, in a civil law countries a civil law country like like France. And we have also these decisions um, of the Council of State from November two thousand and twenty, which. Um, um, so the, the mayor of small city in the north of France files a, file a lawsuit against the refusal of the government to take additional measures against climate change to comply with the reduction target of the Paris Agreement. And in this case, we don't have a, a complete holding yet, but um, the surprisingly, the, the Council of State decided that the the this so the mayor of this small town had sufficient sufficient standing to go to court and to ask for compensation. Um, so that the, the causal link between uh, the the climate change and and uh, the the what was happening in this small city with the the rising of the level of the, the sea was uh, sufficient to for him to claim in court uh, compensation for for the, for the for the harm um and this was attributed in in uh, in part to the to the government failure again to comply with the targets of the UNFCC and the Paris agreement um that were implemented at the national level because these agreements are not um directly applicable into national law which means that you cannot invoke directly uh, a, a treaty in, in, in the, under French law. So we are waiting for new decisions to know what if the governments can demonstrate that uh, the measures that have been taken so far are sufficient to meet the 2030 greenhouse gas reduction emission targets. If no, uh, this is very likely that the, the court will order the government to uh, change the law to have more uh, stringent uh, goals and objectives um, to to be able to meet the the target that are um, set in the law. So thank you for for your attention, and um, I take uh, I I will answer any question you may have. Thank you so much, Pierre, for sharing with us the policies or the status as well of compliance with um, international environmental agreements in the European Union. We already have a few questions in the chat box. Um, and if our audience wants to ask any questions, please do just type it in in the chat box and then we can get to that later on in the moderated discussion. So we've seen how um, environmental governance and policies looks both on the international scale as high as the UN and then for, um, down to the European Union. Now we will further focus on the implementation of these international environmental laws as well as um, Alexandra, other... Alexandra, sorry. Sorry, sorry to disturb you if you, if you don't mind. Uh, Anna and, and Vicente, they had a couple of questions for, uh, for Pierre. And maybe it's good just to tackle it if you don't mind. Like this, we can keep the, the flow of the conversation. So Anna, I do understand that you have a case in Brazil uh, with similar effect. And Vicente, you, you had a question for Pierre. Oh, yes, I'll have uh, Vicente talk first and then I'll follow with the example after Nadia's question. Thank you. Uh, no, I, just a quick question, Pierre, uh, because you had mentioned uh, the, the taxes were uh, sort of like within the sole jurisdiction of member states in the EU. And I was wondering, because there is now all this talk about carbon border adjustment measures, right? Uh, being That the EU is planning as part of the Green Deal uh, being imposed. Um, I don't know what the design of that measure is, whether it's going to be a tax, additional tariff or something, but uh, is this something that is within the juris competence of the commission itself to impose? Or is this something that should be done by member states or is required to be done by member states? And how would that be dealt with? So, just a question, because it's, it's, uh, it's important uh, in terms of both the design of that measure 
um, for us to be able to assess the WTO legality of that measure. And second, what the possible impact of that measure would be on the EU's trading partners, such as in developing countries. Thank you. Um, sorry, Vishen, what, what measure is that? So, so, um... uh, yeah, yeah. The, so there's, uh, I, I read uh, that in the Green Deal, uh, there yeah. is, uh, uh, as part of the uh, climate package, they are planning to impose uh, what they call a carbon border adjustment measure. Um, I think uh, I, I think it might be some kind of um, additional um, fee or, or finance, financial charge yeah. uh, uh, that would be imposed on, say, steel uh, coming from India or yeah. cement, you know, coming from China. Um, and the idea there is that that charge, financial charge would uh, be equivalent to the cost of the carbon content of an equi equi equivalent uh, amount of say, steel or cement. You know? so, so it's too like, they, they, well, the idea, I guess, is to like levelize the, 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 the cost, you know. Yes, to, yes. So. Um, I think this is a lot, you have a competence for the, the, the union as a competence for the environment, but uh, I think this is more related to um, the, 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 the tariffs outside the EU. So this is something that the, 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 EU, the, the EU commission can regulate. And um, the thing that ca they cannot do, this is like impose tax for all members on po polluting activities, for example. This is something that is for the, the member states to impose to their own, own industry. But what they can do is impose uh, tariffs at the borders of the EU, so outside the EU, for products that are entering into the EU uh, and which are like where there, there, the, the Open Commission considered that there is an environment, environmental dumping. Uh, uh, so this is also to protect the, 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 the European industry that claims that this is not fair to have such a uh, such constraints on the, the the European industry. If uh, China, India, and other uh, countries do not respect the same standards, so this is a um, this is um, a measures to 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 combat com to fight against um, environmental dumping. But this is in this is a competence of this is tax outside EU. So this is something then that the, the, the EU institution can deal with. Thank you. Thank you. That's good to know. Thank you. Pierre, um, perhaps uh, before going with uh, with Anna, so would you think that or do you believe, and this is one of the questions that Nadia shared with us, um, that these kind of fines would be would be effective for changing the behavior of these manufacturers and industries. What do you think about it? It's a useful way to, to have these uh, kind of measures, uh, fines, penalties, sanctions, rather than other um, uh, alternatives, like incentives, I don't know. What do you think about it? And then I would like to jump into Brazil with Anna. Um, uh, this is... This is uh, within the EU, the EU, again, this is, um, sanctions are something that are um, for the member states to, de to decide. So in most re environmental regulation, you have, uh, you, you, you have the, the part on sanctions is for the, the member states to decide. Uh, and, and, and this is implemented at the, the national level. So the European Commission has no real powers uh, or EU institution generally real power on how it is implemented. Uh, if, if states are not implementing uh, uh, in a sufficient way uh, the, the, the requirements of the directive, they can be sanctioned, but the, the, the commissions cannot do anything about the, the fines and penalties that, that are decided by, by the member states. But th this is a good question. Um, as a practitioner, um, I, I can see that, that that uh, the, the fines may change the, 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 the behavior of the, of the industry. Uh, but to be honest, the fines are, are not very um, dissuasive. Um, 
this is um, in France, the fines are, are um, not not very um, um, high. So that's I don't think this is something that that really uh, distresses for for the uh, for the industry. Uh, uh, I think that the things that are more and more um, play play a role to to uh, incentive the, the industry to 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 comply with regulation is is the way the public is informed about it. They are very um, the, the reputational risk is something that they take into consideration, uh, and they don't want to be seen as the, 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 the polluters. Uh, they want to be seen as um, uh, responsible uh, industrial that are uh, complying with the law, uh, 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 having due diligence, um, uh, trying to make their impact on the environment uh, less and less important. So this is more, uh, I think the penalties are, of course, have. Um, a role to play in the implementation of environmental regulations. But I think for the industry, more and more, this is the way they are seen that makes the, the difference for the implementation of, of, of environmental law. And, and last point, maybe there was, uh, there is a directive that was adopted, I think, uh, in 2008 about the, the criminal policy with regard to the environment, because many member states didn't have um, criminal fines or penalties mm -hmm. when, when there are uh, infringements of the, the environmental uh, laws and regulations. So uh, there was a, um, a will uh, of the EU institution to harmonize the, 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 the legal framework and provide means for, for member states to uh, impose uh, criminal sanctions in case of, of infringements. Thank you, Pierre. Um, what do you, what's your view uh, from Brazil, Anna, in, in related to this the same topic and the same question, please? Sure, thank you, Maria. So the example that I wanted to give is that it's actually very recent. Um, and I think Pierre is completely correct that uh, command control and fines are not the only solution. But uh, the example that, uh, that I have to give is from so the, the sugar cane um, industry has a very uh, common practice to set fire to its uh, entirety area. So it will grow again and uh, have prosperity in the next uh, season. Uh, and that fire is usually um, controlled. However, there are a lot of fires that are not controlled and set out by uh, third parties. And, and so what happened is that the state um, EPA or Environmental Protection Agency here in Sao Paulo, where the, there is a large um, area for sugar cane industry, started um, issuing fines and penalties in order to um, diminish the amount of fires that were spreading out in the state. And so uh, what happened was uh, several associations and, and companies sat down together and defined uh, ways to um, have a, a regulation on how to put those fires and how to control them and presented them to the state government. And so, and, and this was really rec recent, uh, the state government even altered their regulations on how to monitor the fires uh, into to, uh, 2020. And uh, so, although uh, we have a big contingency of um, of fines issued and then uh, after the companies uh, present their defenses and, and they really fight these penalties. Uh, this was a really good example of how um, these companies through their associations had the will to change uh, and, and set how they, they should control these fires because of the penalties they were receiving and because it was so many um, it, it not only, uh, well, it is a penalty. Um, they, they didn't just issue penalties to, uh, uh, with fines, but they also like to stop the activity and that's very damaging to them. And so I, I think it was a, a really good example of, of, um, 
of will of power to, to, to change uh, their activity. So that's the example that I wanted to. That's very interesting because what you both are mentioning is just, it is, it is not only, um, well, one, I, 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 it's one leg you need to, to have this, this, um, this system to working on is to have these um, regulations and with fines and sanctions and penalties, but also other kind of measures. But uh, in order for them to work proper, properly, you need to have very strong institutions to carry on mm -hmm. with this work, to carry on with uh, um, the application of fines, and for instance, that, that their decisions uh, are being respected um, when they are challenged in court, for, in, uh, for example. So Vicente was uh, talking uh, to the panelists about uh, a particular example in the US. So would you mind Vicente to share your views on, uh, on this issue, please? Uh, thanks, thanks Maria. Uh, sure, uh, no, I was just, I was just reflecting on, on um, I think it was Nadia's question in the chat box about you know the role of regulations and fines in terms of shaping corporate behavior and and you know from from studies I had I mean I'm not that old but I I did remember reading at one point that um, the reason why U.S. car manufacturers started um, making more fuel efficient cars you know as compared to the, uh, um, the 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 cars that they were producing in the 50s and 60s was that in the mid 70s. Um, the federal government started imposing um, uh, fuel economy uh, standards for corporate fleets and stuff like that rolled over into uh, shaping uh, into shaping how um, uh, you know how, how governments um, uh, and corporations then um, you know developed uh, the, the, the cars that were being produced in the US but I think uh, the, this, Question both what uh, Anna uh, Anna was pointing out, and I think what, what Nadia was was asking, and sort of like my my own uh, question or, or comment was, um, what then is the sort of like the the that appropriate role of the state, right, in terms of shaping and enforcing changes in technology, uh, corporate behavior, and consumer preferences. Right. Uh, so I, I think you know, most of us, are, or all of us here, will take it as a given that obviously we cannot have a command and control type of economy. I mean that has been proven to not work. Uh, you know, case in point, North Korea and the Soviet Union. Uh, but at the same time, I think um, it's also pretty clear. Uh, you know, given that. Uh, as, as Sir Nicholas Stern pointed out uh, in his, you know, um, groundbreaking book. Uh, a, a decade ago, but the economics of climate change, that climate change is a market failure, which means that we cannot also just leave it up to market forces to decide what to do about climate change. So there has to be that sort of like appropriate balance uh, between state level uh, go or government level regulation and exercise of police, of, of, of policy uh, with shaping and guiding both corporate behavior and consumer preferences. Maybe those of us living here in Europe are much more used to that, but in the US, I think it's still a very big wide open debate, uh, you know, especially with the sort of like more extreme polarization now between the Republicans and the Democrats there, uh, whereas in, in Europe and maybe in other parts of the world that, that you know, that sort of like division of, of views is, is not as grave. Um, Clearly, in China, for example, um, they've they've plunked down on that other end of the thing, which is not necessarily a fully command and control economy, but one where the state is really much more directive in terms of cor corporate behavior. And I think we are seeing um, positive effects of that uh, in terms of the environmental conditions that have been rapidly improving in China. Um, I mean, I, I've been going there back and you know for, for for almost a couple of decades now, and I've seen you know such a massive change in terms of of uh, what Beijing and Shanghai, for example, looked like in the mid 2000s, pollution, smog, and all that, and what it looked like last time I was there, which is like a couple of years ago. So uh, so anyway, just just my points. Thank you. That's a wonderful reflection, Nadia. What do you think about it? Well, I think the, the points, 
Yeah, the points are, are very well made. Uh, and I uh, want to add to Vincente's uh, 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 example of what happened in the 1970s in the United States. I remember those times very well. I had a 1972 uh, Volkswagen Super Beetle, which for $5 would fill up the tank and would take me a very, very long distance. The contributing factor in the 70s, too, was also the oil embargo, the OPEC oil embargo. And most Americans had very large cars, typical gas guzzlers, very typical, you know, massive machines that didn't go very far in a tank of gas. That, I think, also contributed tremendously to the change in on the part of the government to force manufacturers to move toward more efficient, um, less uh, polluting, and certainly less consuming uh, vehicles. Wonderful, Nadia. Um, thank you for, for sharing your thoughts. Um, I don't know, Alex, if you want to, to, to add something or we can I'll start with the other presentation so we can after having these presentations, have more um, conversations and, um, and sharing of, of, of ideas. Yes. Thank you, Maria. And thank you for that um, such a lively discussion um, among our panelists, too. So um, that it actually segues us um, greatly to the next presentations, where we've seen how it works in the EU. And we've seen how um, international environmental policy as well is set up. And now we really get to zero in as well and how this looks like in uh, domestic application or in in-country application with Brazil as our example. So today we have um, Enrique Pisaya as well as Ana Carolina Duque who will be both talking to us about um, environmental policy and governance in Brazil in relation to all the things that we've seen in international environmental policy and the, uh, the examples as well that we've seen from Europe. So um, we'll start with Enrique, who is the chief of staff of Fon Plata. Go ahead, Enrique. Thank you, Alex. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. I don't know. Good night. We have audience from all over the world. Uh, here in Brazil, I'm in Brazil currently, so it's morning. Uh, Thank you, and first of all, congratulations, Alban, for the amazing week. Uh, three intense days of discussions, uh, really well organized, and with this uh, uh, huge audience that we reach. It's a pleasure for me to be here uh, talking after Vicente and Pierre um, and before Anna. Uh, so uh, I really love the panel today. I really love the discussions uh, from, that we are having. Uh, I'll try to be really fast because uh, I think we have a lot of questions and a lot of things to discuss and the time is running. Uh, so, and, and, and I really love to be today in the panel because you touch several points that we stress every day. We stress every time in our conversations that we, we need multidisciplinarity approach to, to this environmental um, this environment revolution we are having. Uh, currently, uh, after what Vicent said, Vicent pointed out a lot uh, the, how, how the international diplomacy uh, works with, with this environmental new, new mindset, uh, how, can, how different countries and different uh, people think about not just negotiation, but uh, this, this whole green revolution, uh, the needs of developing and developed countries. Uh, the, the needs and the mindset of developing and developed countries. Uh, we work a lot as a bank with the needs of uh, developing countries, and the needs are a lot, uh, really, really different. Uh, Pierre touched uh, several interesting points that are the difference between civil law and common law, and the fees and the fines, and how can we, we work ahead and how can we, we go on ahead. Uh, and, and this all shows uh, us like th that we need this multidisciplinary view. We need this uh, new idea. I will talk a bit about the economic side of it. Uh, I'm, I'm a lawyer, as, as you know, but I'm also uh, an economist. So I will try to talk about uh, what, what, how, how money talks. Like this is one of my favorite phrases, one of my favorite sentences. And so uh, th this, all, all that we are doing, will never happen without money, you know? Uh, 
And it's, we are in the middle of a revolution. And I always say, is it the green revolution? And oh, it, it's not a revolution. Yeah, it is. We are discussing about fees and fines and how punish people and, and how companies are not adapting or how our companies will adapt and how governments are adapting or not. So we, we, are, we are having this change and this shift of mindset. Uh, we are having um, forwards and pushbacks. We are going ahead and, and getting back going. And, and the pandemic uh, showed us uh, a completely new way of working. Today we are, we are hanging out here in, in Zoom and we are not huddling as this and shows how, how, to, how to change the world. We, I, I don't know how we will write down the, the last paper here because we don't have this huddling event to, 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 to sign off and to decide what we, we will publish. Uh, and it's a new way, and it's a it's a it's a real revolution that that we are we are facing now. And and to show you some figures, uh, the the green bond market uh, now it reached one trillion. So it, it's one trillion dollar in issues of of bonds uh, to the market. And and maybe when you compare with the annual uh, bond issuing, it's just one percent of the of the issues, but the green market is a, is a bit new. It's, it started in 2007. The first uh, bond issuing was made by World Bank and European, uh, European Investment Bank. Uh, it was really, really small. It was $100 million um, in issuance. And now after these years, this almost 15 years, we, we finally reached the one, the one trillion market. And, and when we think as a, as a green perspective uh, and as this green revolution, it's, it's a bit, uh, we, we say the numbers are small, but maybe if we see what cryptocurrency is doing and how they sell themselves, maybe they are a bit smarter in how, the way they sell themselves. Because uh, the, 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 the cryptocurrency market is currently 2 trillion. And they say that they are growing really fast. So yeah, we, we so people talk more about cryptocurrency, and people are more willing to to invest in cryptocurrency than in, in green investment or green growth, or or, or discussing the these regulations. Maybe uh, we we could promote better ourselves if we start putting these numbers uh, on the table and saying yes, we we have this one trillion in bonds issuing and more what the governments are doing in-house, more what the governments and companies are investing in, the, in their companies and, and in, in this green market. So uh, maybe we need this shift of, of approach. This is, this is my first insight. We, we need to, to show more the numbers and, and, and less uh, the, the difficulties because the difficulties we all know, they are all there. We have this, the problems with, uh, what, what, uh, how to adapt, how to report, uh, how to measure, how to regulate it. That, that's what we are talking today. We're talking about how to regulate it and then how to, to, to ask people reporting. So you said you, 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 you covered all the environmental aspects or you were being a green uh, company. So if you are not doing this, how we, we punish you, how we issue a fine, a fee, uh, and, and, and more, we, and, and it's, of course, it's really important. We are basically lawyers here and we are really, really interested in this, uh, regulations, but we also need to look, uh, to, to how to, 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 to make money of it or, or how to make, uh, it more profitable or how that the, this green revolution can be. Uh, aligned with generating more cash and more more uh, opportunities of investment and 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 you know we we have a lot of these uh, institutions we have a lot of these uh, environmental uh, approaches we have United Nations we have UNDP we have the Paris Agreement we have the the, the COPs we have. Uh, the financial commons that reach a lot of international institutions. And we need a more uh, common and a more holistic view of how to approach in the green, uh, the, the, the green agenda and this uh, climate change and this adaptation and mitigation of 
uh, investments. So just to give you one example, what we are working with, uh, and that's not only Brazil, it affects all the region, uh, the South American region. We, and, and the world actually, uh, we had this financing commons. Financing commons was an event uh, held last year in, in, in Paris. Unfortunately, it was online and it put together 460 development banks. So national, international, and the, the idea, the key idea was to push forward the green agenda. And, and now the, the question, the big question uh, we, we are issuing a document is not uh, if we will invest in climate change uh, approach. Uh, th this step is already, is already in the past. Like the, the, the discussion, if we need or not, it's, it's, in, it's past. Like the, 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 the key, uh, the quick question now is how? Uh, how can we uh, push forward the climate change agenda? And it's not if, uh, because for, for banks, for development banks, it's, it's, it's already over. We, we, we need to, to focus and we need to go forward to green, to green investment to green, and, and, and work together again now with lawyers, policymakers, and how to make these uh, incentives and not only fees and fines. So we need to look how to push and we need to nudge and we need to do uh, steps forward and not just punishment. Uh, and, and of course, markets is, is one of the, the ideas. And, and of course, in the regulations, we need to stop thinking only in how to punish. And we also look how to punish the ones that are not complying. And we, we need to see ways how to foster and how to incentivize people Keep investing, people, companies, uh, and, and 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 the mindset of 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 uh, climate investment. Uh, so so I will leave I, I will leave uh, the floor uh, for you to keep the the, the conversation and, and questions. Uh, but but this is my this is our insight, my insight especially. Uh, we 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 need to think in, in green growth as as a reality. And not just green growth, uh, ESG, SDGs. Uh, we have all this framework. We, we, of course, we have some challenges, mainly how to deal with policies, how to do with reporting, how to audit this, how to avoid and prevent greenwashing, uh, ESDG washing, uh, how to bring together all these uh, different views. Uh, I don't want to go too much in ESG because you had this, this conversation in other panels and I want to keep focusing policies and uh, for, for green growth. But this is also a reflect of this revolution because when we have this LGBTI plus movement, when we have this George Floyd, Me, uh, Lives Matter, Me Too, all these movements shows that the difficulties the world face are are the, every country faced the same problem, just with a different um, approach. Brazil, Malaysia, France, Peru, we all have the same problems. And with social media now, we can, we can see that other, other countries and other people are suffering the same of us. So we start to get voice, uh, minorities starting to get voice, minorities are starting to get positions in boards, in C-suits, so the, the world is having a new mindset and a new shift of mindset and policies need to follow this, 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 this path. We had this conversation before in people that follow our panels, uh, how to have like kind of regulatory sandbox for, for green growth or for ESG or for uh, how could we think new ways and different ways thinking forward and not thinking only backwards. That's my, my, my insights for now. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Enrique. And um, it was an interesting realization that you pointed out that yes, um, truly, this gen generation seems like they're more willing to invest in all these um, other types of bit 
Bitcoin and um, other types of stocks are supposed to be in bonds. And it's interesting, I think, and you hit the nail in the head when you said that it might be a marketing problem. We might not be marketing ourselves properly or well enough to this new type of um, investors. Um, so thank you for that. And um, we'll move on to um, Ana Carolina Duque, who will again share with us. Um, we're still with um, Brazil and will share with us the um, existing policies and initiatives to further provide um, governance and en environmental protection in Brazil. Go ahead, Anna. Anna, by the way, um, is the senior associate in Pinero NATO Advogados. Go ahead, Anna. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. Um, sorry that I did not present myself uh, earlier. Um, I'm uh, also a LLM alumni from UC Berkeley from 2013-14. So, um, uh, and thank, of course, BGS and everyone for um, hosting this amazing event. Um, it's funny because uh, we didn't uh, discuss me and Hiki before on the views that um, regulatory standards and command control is just uh, not the only way for environmental protection, but it's the way that I feel as well. And it was the first thing in my organization um, and um, as a panelist here to, to talk about a little bit about Brazil. And that is because, well, our tradition here in Brazil as a civil law country has always been as to provide command control. And um, we have rules since 1981 about our environmental policies and sanctioning in liabilities as to uh, to repair fully and to have uh, joint and several liability and uh, have penal, um, criminal sanctions to those who um, to those who pollute and still we are seeing in the news um, deforestation and uh, the um, the problems that lies with solely uh, betting on command control. And this is um, at this point for us, it's because we are in uh, economic trouble. Uh, the fact is that command control requires money, requires investment from the state. And if the, the, the state does not have the money to provide that, that means that the standards and monitoring will not occur. So um, we do have our federal constitution, uh, national environmental policies. We do have a national policy on climate change, but it mainly focused on command control, which we see that is not, um, it is not the only way and should not be the only way to provide it. If you see what Pierre said, uh, they, they have uh, cap and trade, they have now new agreements and, and what we are, what I wanted to, to show here is that there are incipient uh, forms of um, viewing the, the law differently and uh, it, it's still ongoing here in Brazil, but uh, I just wanted to point out some examples. So the first one is from Hanova Bio, uh, which are bonds issued from sugarcane industry and to provide uh, those who have a greener view or, on plantation or development of um, alcohol uh, to, to have these bonds. It's a very small, um, and it's still uh, under regulation. It started in 2017, uh, recent regulations for from 2019 and 2020. So it's still ongoing. And it, it seems that... Uh, uh, it, it, it is funny because the although the idea was to comply with the Paris Agreement, that was a very short um, explanation as to all the economic benefits that the industry industry would gain from this cap and uh, trade industry. So uh, I just wanted to point out that, as Enrique said, uh, money talks, and sometimes. It is the greatest incentive to provide for uh, environmental protection. Uh, I also wanted to point out that there are several um, initiatives. So we have now for payment for environmental services that the government is trying to, to, um, uh, to, to develop, which is the Forest Plus. 
uh, also uh, regulation that was uh, very much waited for uh, in order to have those who were destroying the, the, the forest to now uh, receiving to protect it. But I was discussing, and that, then that's the great thing about this Green Week, I was talking to Tiago, who spoke on day two, and his view uh, being there in the Amazon is a little bit different because it's different to, to have those policies applied to the individual there in the, the forest. So um, again, here implementation of these policies are, are difficult, but hopefully uh, ongoing. And then there are two initiatives here that I wanted to talk about to give like this positive and leave us with positive examples. Um, first is a bill of law that was issued last year, uh, which is to initiate social, uh, to, to create social bonds and credits to foster education. So because of COVID-19, uh, several schools closed and were unable to continue their activities. Actually, my daughter's school, uh, ha that happened to, to her. She, she, we have to now search for a new school. Um, and so these green bonds are um, still under discussion, discussion um, for, for the creation of these social bonds and have further investments in education, which is interesting. And then also, I think that uh, tackles uh, and Hicke's initiative on uh, the recent public hearings for the um, central bank in Brazil, where they are trying to um, update the resolution that they had on how to disclose environmental risks, how to disclose environmental and uh, uh, climate change risks, and have uh, banks foster and um, really undertake uh, environmental um, environmental uh, risks uh, seriously. So uh, the the current um, text of these uh, updates on the the resolutions that were existing that are existing since two thousand fourteen uh, provide a new view and more seriousness to the open language that they uh, that they. It, it exists since 2014. So I think these examples show that uh, there are other ways than command control. I know we're talking about policies, but these are different policies. And I think they are more in line of for what we, what we need currently, especially because of um, it, the difficulty in investing in command control. And just on a, a positive note that, um, that we have for the future and for, for environmental prote protection. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, there. Thank you so much, um, Anna, for that. And now we will um, move on to our moderated discussion in open forum. So if anyone still has any questions that they'd like to type in in the chat box, Maria would um, be able to see it and she could ask our experts on the panel. Go ahead, Maria. Thank you, Alex. Um, indeed, they were very wonderful presentations. So I really want to start with the conversations, if you don't mind. I know that Oban will, um, will also have some other questions and we are trying to, to make this a conversation actually, rather than question answer, I prefer to, to manage it a little bit more lightly, if you don't mind. So basically what I'm keeping from all of you is that for for this governance to succeed, we have to have some strong institutions. And the way that traditionally have been seeing these institutions is not working at all and probably will not work on environmental issues. So um, you talk about changes in regulations, changes in policies, uh, use of new approaches, nudges, you mentioned that and Enrique. So what do you think will be like the key um, component, the key issue uh, to start looking into a more modern uh, way of, of creating this uh, governance framework to improve the environmental um, changes that we need. You can, you can start talking. Um, first, first come, first uh, talk. <laughs>
Okay, uh, I, I'll jump in. Uh, yeah. Sure. And again, as as I as I was talking, uh, uh, we have this, this 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 real problem. Maybe as Alex pointed out of marketing, maybe we are we are not marketing ourselves correctly, or maybe we're not thinking uh, in a coordinated way. Uh, as I said before, uh, maybe the 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 fintech world is doing a better job than us in in doing their revolution than we are in doing in our revolution uh because we there there are several steps ahead maybe that's the the problem of civil law against common law maybe because the ones pushing ahead the fintech revolution and maybe vicent uh as as he's coming from asia he has a better uh point of view or a closer point of view of what's happening in, in, in Hong Kong or even UK, USA. So these are the ones that are pushing forward the, 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 the FinTech revolution. And maybe uh, we as civil law countries are the ones pushing the green agenda. So maybe uh, it's maybe it can show us that civil law is a bit slower than common law. Or maybe Maybe we can we we can have this this insight. I'm 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 not sure. Uh, uh, you as working maybe Pierre also working more with European regulations and European the French law and Italian law and 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 and, and German law, as we we are more focused on in in what's written. And I think also Vincent pointed out uh, the the way that we we judges. Uh, uh, judge the way that civil judges judge differently from uh, common law uh, judge judge maybe uh, we we could we could take this revolution in a, in a different point of view maybe copying what they are doing as I said sandbox and things like that I don't know I, I think Pierre you could you could add a lot of things from your conversation and also visit from your point of view and, and Nana from the Yes, I, I, I agree. Um, I think we, we need a, a more coordinated answer to, to climate change and environmental issues. Um, at the global at the global level, level for sure, there are like issues of governance that uh, Vicente um, uh, uh, exposed uh, earlier. Uh, but we have we have the same the same issues locally that that. That's that's why the, the commission just just try to have something a more comprehensive uh, framework to deal with with environmental issues that are in in every part of our uh, daily life and make something make on environmental concerns more um, more uh, integrated in 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 um, in, in all policies, I, I think, for example, to um, biodiversity, um, because it's a, a topic I'm, 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 I'm more familiar with. Uh, and this is true that if you look at the, the policies, uh, biodiversity policies um, in, in, in France, this, this is a total nonsense that, that, that you, don't, you don't have the, the different ministries, if we talk about governance, the different ministries don't take into consideration, uh, the treasury doesn't take into consider consideration biodiversity when making a decision. Uh, the, the agriculture uh, ministry doesn't take into consideration th this, the, the position of the environmental ministry on, on this topic. So this is like very fragmented in all uh, in all ministries, and you don't have a global a global perspective on that. And I think the Commission is making the the first move, saying environmental issues are everywhere. We we cannot deal with climate change just with the two thousand and three directive. We need uh, more instruments. We need to make people uh, um, aware of this issue, but uh, not only in uh, by establishing a, a market for operators and, and individual and, 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 and legal persons, but also by um, making uh, people start to um, um, ask 
to through their governments to the industry more efforts and themselves um, be aware that in their daily life their the, the way they're behaving the, the the way they're they're consuming is 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 very important for the the, the future of the of the of the the the, the, the environment so <clears throat> i think this uh, this is this we we this is a start we are we are we are having now a, a global concern we we have more consultation uh, within ministries uh, within uh, we have a more coordinated governance but this is really what what we need we need that people that are deciding for the on the economic field uh, uh, be aware of the environment biodiversity climate change and make the, the, the good decision based on um, this, um, this, this criteria as well. So I think this is a, the, the most important thing that, that we need to, the, the most important change that we, we need to, to see, uh, to have a real change in the, in the, in the, in the coming years. Um, yeah, you, you mentioned and, and you pointed several times that this, we need to, to have this articulation, coordination that is essential for, for improving the governance. And you just said uh, just recently that we need perhaps a push from a global perspective. But if I recorded correctly, what Vincent, Vicente mentioned in, their, uh, in, in, the, in his presentation, it was totally the opposite and I really want to, to address it Vicente with you because it seems like it's more difficult to have this global approach with so many insights and inputs and views and since we have these two broad uh, and different perspectives this the north and the south the developed and less developed so how can this idea that Pierre points out uh, now could be um, in practice um, can, can we work uh, with it in practice or do you think it's not possible or have you seen a different way of, of, of getting to the solution? Yeah. Uh, th thanks, Maria. That, that's a very tough and interesting question, really. Um, but and it's something that sort of like uh, in, in, in terms of the work that I do uh, with both governments and with uh, civil society organizations in sort of like this climate area, it's something that we're trying to deal with. Um, and I think uh, maybe one can do is um, uh, look at uh, climate action in maybe in, in terms of levels, right? Um, one can look at sort of like climate action at the individual level. What can we do as individuals, you know, you and me uh, at, 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 you know, at certain points. So that could include changes in our individual lifestyles. Uh, maybe not driving the car or, or going vegetarian or, or, or something, right? Um, but then, on, and then that provides certain uh, societal benefits, I would say, uh, because it helps reduce consumption levels and all that. Now, this will have different ways. You, one can see... Can, this can be done in different ways. It can be done maybe more easily in a developed country context where basic social needs are met, uh, you know, uh, as opposed to a developing country context where people generally are poor and it would not make sense to say, you know, go vegetarian when you can't, you can barely afford vegetables anyway, or where McDonald's is the cheap, cheapest food available because, you know, the more organic ones are more expensive. So, so, and, and that would be at the level of individual choice. But then the level of individual choice often also gets circumscribed by what the market in your community is able to provide, right? Um, and what the market is able to provide in your community often gets dictated by both consumer choice or consumer preferences, and what the uh, regulations are that exist that uh, say what kind or you know what quality of goods can be provided to the people in that certain market, and that is then where sort of like this intersection between individual action and uh, market behavior and sort of like state level um, you know, policy comes in, um, 
where, and I take Enrique's uh, points, very fair point, where one can look at a state level uh, policy and regulation in two ways. One, it could be through a, a uh, punitive way, uh, which uh, governments are very often uh, find it very easy to do. And it can be through an incentive, incentivizing way. Um, and here, uh, I think that is where you have to find that appropriate balance, given the constraints of the legal and political system that you are in. So um, in, in for those of us who come from civil law jurisdictions, it's, it tends to be much easier for states to think of, of lawmaking from a very punitive approach. This is the law. If you don't comply with this, you're dead, right? Uh, whereas in a more common law jurisdiction, uh, it tends to be uh, individual action tends to be much more preferred and therefore the law tends to be much more directory or or maybe provides both penalties but incentives at the same time. And I think this is where those two jurisdictions can learn from each other. Um, Alex and I come from a uh, jurisdiction where we actually have both. Uh, because we were colonized by Spain for 350 years and then by the U.S. for 50 years. And so our, our political, our legal system in the Philippines is a mixture of Napoleonic civil law uh, and uh, U.S. mostly commercial and economic law, you know, overlaid on, on top of each other. Um, but I, I think at, at the end of the day, the, the question of how do you deal with these different levels of climate action from the individual to the uh, national level and then going on to the international level is a question of uh, how far and how fast us as individuals and as citizens as a collective uh, would be able to push those who prefer to represent us, right? What? So can that's, we, that's, sorry, you know, so, so I, what I'm trying to say is, so can we, uh, so in terms of individual action, Right. So aside from our choices of, OK, I'm going to be riding a bicycle to work, uh, assuming you can ride a bicycle to work and you don't get run over by those crazy drivers in Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro. Uh, right. Uh, which which uh, don't respect bicycle bicyclists at all. Um, or in Lima, for example, I and mean, I've been to Lima and <laughs> maybe side. It's a challenge. Even, right. Yeah, it's a challenge. Manila as well. So. Um, so from that, uh, could we also see climate individual action as being in the nature of political action, right? So uh, do we uh, see it as an individual choice that we also become more responsible in terms of pushing our political systems in, in a direction where we want it to deliver greater levels of public goods in terms of climate action? And that might then involve either you create your own party or you join a political party that best represents, you know, your own individual vision of what a clean and green society could look like. Uh, and then uh, and then maybe push and then or, you know, as, as uh, uh, I, I remember uh, um, during both the time of Bush and, you know, Trump, you know, many of my American friends were we're saying, you know, one of the best ways to to um, to uh, become uh, to, to change the trajectory, uh, the political trajectory of the U.S. Uh, was to get engaged in politics themselves. So they became much more active in the Democratic Party or in the Social Democrats or whatever. You know, so that could also be one of the, those things. Indiv individual choice translated into political action. Uh, which translates into policy decisions that can be made for the betterment of society. Yeah, Thanks. this is wonderful, and I uh, because I really want everybody to talk and just just give me one second to 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 feed your ideas, and I really want to know all of your uh, of your insights about this. What you mentioned is very interesting, uh, Vicente, because you 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 puts on every person the power to, to do a change, but also for society to make this change possible. And I, I think Enrique will, will um, correct me, Eleanor Armstrong also mentioned that, that the society can push for a bottom-up uh, decisions rather than top-down decisions. But they also need to have these um, institutions, this governance, strong governance. So you can push for change, but on the other side, you need the other uh, side of the coin, no, because there are two faces of the same coin. 
strong institutions that goes in the same direction from society. Otherwise there will be a clash among them. And, and that could feed into these decisions. You know? and, what, uh, and just another thing, another thing that I, I was uh, thinking about what you said, uh, Vicente, is that it is true that for, for, for instance, for less developed countries, it's more difficult to have these, um, um, these choices available because we lack of so many things. So this is one of the, the most difficult challenges. And also the institutions are weak because even though they have the power to sanction some uh, conducts, they don't have the, uh, enough resources to do these enforcement actions. So sometimes law is just a very uh, wishful thinking uh, wording on a paper that you can collect, but there are no means or instruments to enforce them correctly. So this is our, these are my thoughts. Uh, I'm trying to gather all of, of your presentations and I really want your inputs uh, regarding this. So please uh, share with us um, your insights. And Maria, you yeah. just described mm -hmm. Brazil for me. I don't know if Enrique agrees, <laughs> but uh, that's exactly it. We have so many laws and we have this beautiful constitution talking about which is the environment being on um, everyone's right. And if you do not have your, then coming out to what Vicente said, your, uh, your own understanding and that you have to change. And then I go back to example that I give on the sugar cane. If these uh, producers did not have their organizations and presented to the state uh, protection agency what they were seeing and, and how it could be changed because they have the knowledge of the day-to-day -day, um, understanding of how uh, the, the, this form of um, burnings occur and what they should do and how to control. And then if the, the state uh, agency wasn't um, prepared and, and, and strong enough, this would continue to occur databases and fines would be issues and then go to court and then court would sanction or not. And so it just, it, it's a, it, it continues to go around on the same problem and not be solved. So I think this individual power that you have, uh, that you have to change and you have to think of alternatives is it's very important and um, to, to, to try to shift even legislation and how things are currently doing to a, a better solution. It, it, it's interesting that I'm, I'm receiving several WhatsApp messages about this discussion and, uh, and people, I think they're watching in YouTube and so they're not uh, putting questions in, this, in the chat and, and opinions. And many people agree with you, Anna, and, and they're saying that it's it's up to people to 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 push their politicians to do the, the change and and, and the, the, there should be a a, a private or an individual uh, push. Uh, you you know uh, I agree that we need some 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 top down regulations, but we 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 tend to wait for these top-down regulations. And I don't think that's, that's the, the ideal way of, of dealing with things because it takes time. Uh, Vincent, as, as, you, as you showed, like, and the, the decisions in, in, in if, if we, we go out of our countries and we go to international agenda, the decisions are made by the, the people with money and the ones that's in the middle of the huddle, as you said. Uh, and usually the ones in the middle of the huddle are not, uh, Africa or Botswana or Nigeria or Peru, uh, sometimes Brazil, but usually not even Brazil. So basically it will be USA, France, UK, you know, Norway. Uh, so this, maybe these top-down decisions don't reflect what we want and what our countries want or what our countries need in the international agenda. Maybe uh, we have a saying in Brazil of good intentions, hell is, is full of, right? Uh, 
or hell is full of good intentions. Like, uh, not usually good, good intentions are what people really need. And <laughs> yeah, I, you agree, Anna? I, I see you smiling uh, as the, uh, about what you're saying. And we, you know, uh, so usually it, it should come from, or must come from daily practices. And that's why I, I, I stress the difference between civil law and common law. And, and a good example that we also in civil law countries, we use, we use international uh, trade law. It's, it's basically common law. Our countries just put some things in our civil codes and, and, and trade codes, but basically we just reflect the, the, the market uh, practices. Usually we just follow uh, inco terms and things like that. It, it, it's there for centuries, not, not, not decades, it's for centuries, the, the trade, law is 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 a as a common law with some some articles uh so uh, I, I really don't know if we really need or if especially in the revolution during this this, this revolution we need uh a lot of top down we need a lot of regulations uh, and strong institutions are important for everything and 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 as vincent said uh, we have some market failures, and when we have market failures, probably the government should act. But we need to identify when we have market failures. We we have to identify the the Anna's example of uh, sugarcane fire. It, it, it's not good. We know that's not good. So we know that it's it's for the externalities are better than the the benefits. So we, you you have more problems uh, if you put fire on your sugarcane camp after you did because not just environmental outcome, but also for other things, uh, it's compared a private uh, benefit, just the sugar cane guy will make money and, and the, the whole society will lose. So yes, the, then the, the government must act. But in some other cases, maybe the government should leave uh, people more free to decide what they want and give incentives. And again, I, I, I'm sorry, uh, repeating the same thing. Incentives. Usually, incentives come from minister of economy or economists or or, or not from lawyers. And maybe that's one of the the, the 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 new way of thinking that lawyers should adapt to. Maybe the the, the judges or maybe the the way the minister of justice we think about incentives. Maybe the incentives could come also from the the legal perspective, not only from the economic. Vicente Pierre, um, Nadia, Alex, Oban, uh, what, what do you think about um, all of what uh, we were talking? I will, I will take my Joker. Think... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's go. I will go after you, Pierre, please. Okay. <laughs> Um, no, I think I, I would I wouldn't be so so critical about top down regulation. I think this is a, our tradition in France. So we are very used to we are more skeptical about market instruments. But I think that's a, a mindset. Um, the the thing is uh, maybe one thing we 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 do not uh, talk about is also the complexity of the law today uh, uh, for the industry for the individuals for for um, even, I guess, for lawmakers them, themselves. I'm not sure they, 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 they understand completely what is, what is the legal, legal framework. Um, and this is when, when dealing with, um, with, with industrials, like as, as a practitioner, uh, giving advice on, on a daily basis, how it works, what they, what they can do, what they can do, it's, ex it's very, very complicated, and uh, only the, the the major companies can deal with all the the regulation because they have the internal resources to know how it works, to know how to, to deal with how, who, who they have to contact in the administration to get the the, the good information. Uh, for for small uh, operators, it's more complicated, uh, and for us, even like. When, when we have to go through all the the, 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 the regulations and the law, it's it's very complicated. Um, and and 
And the implementation is, is, is also complicated for the administration when we deal with um, the, 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 the equivalent of the EPA uh, in France. Uh, the, 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 the locally, it's, they don't know all the regulation. They have to know how it works for waste, for industrial emissions. Uh, they issue permits with additional norms. Uh, and at the end, it's, it's just um, a complete mess. And this is one of the reasons uh, it doesn't work uh, that well. It's, it's not that they, the, 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 the industry doesn't want to implement, but most of the time this, they, they don't have a good understanding of what the, the administration expects from, from them. So, um, and, and I don't say that this, we, we cannot say that it's too complicated, so it, it has to, to, to be simpler. The environment is complex. I mean, there are a lot of issues to deal with, but the thing is we have too many instruments. We have contract, contracts, we have, we have uh, top-down regulations, we have uh, carbon market. So I think this is the, the, one of the, issue, the, 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 the main issues is also to deal with complexity. And I don't, I don't provide a solution. I don't have it. But, but this is also something that we need to take into consideration where designing uh, environmental policies is, is dealing with a, a very uh, complex topic, uh, sci scientific as well, like a, a science-based um, science uh, topic. So we need to take into consideration science um, and, and and yes, I think this, as a practitioner, the main thing I, I see it's like complexity and the difficulty for the industry in particular to deal with, with this complexity and to, to find uh, benefits uh, in, 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 in environmental law, in implementing environmental law. Thank you, Pierre. Now I will use my, my joker. Um, there is still the echo of the word of Nadia in, in my air in the space. We were saying, Nadia, that we are insignificant as, as human. So I like the topic of, of the option, the topic of the choice. Let's try to make significant choice. And in the meantime, it's topic of uh, democracy, direct democracy. And it's also a, a matter of relationship between the people governing, between the industry and us. So what is lacking maybe it is the responsibility of individuals. We don't feel responsible. We don't feel bound by any decision. Uh, it's not just about to be, to be informed. Um, I would also like to add that there is a political agenda. So due to this political agenda, uh, people don't inform us. And at the end of the day, I'm not sure that, for instance, in Europe, people are ready to give up on oil, to give up on plastic, to give up on gas, because they want everything. They want the quality of life, and they also want to say they are green. This is something we have been facing all the week. Everyone now is saying that he's green. The industries that have the green label, the one, one a green stamp, the bank, they are green. But are we really making a green choice? I'm not sure about it. So my question, uh, it's not a solution, but what, one of the questions is maybe the education. It's, to, it's not just to, to give to the industry or the lawyer or to the government all the responsibilities. It is also us as, uh, as people when we, when we use our rubbish, when we make little choice to make, the, to make the, the, the good one. So that's why I'm not always quite comfortable with the uh, Paris Agreement or with the Green Deal because the people are not responsible and it's something missing. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. Uh, uh, but again, it, I'm kind of optimistic most of the times with this topic because again, when you start, when money flows start, uh, everything starts flowing and the money flows it's, it's really difficult to stop the money flow. So when, when as we are seeing the market is growing, the, the bond issue is growing, we're having several regulations, we're having this new mindset. And as I said, people want 
their their plastic bags and they want their plastic chocolate and the chocolate inside another one plastic for the chocolate and one plastic for every piece of chocolate <laughs> and, and and maybe in Europe is less. If you go to United States, we all studied the United States, and you, you know you you open uh, maybe the, the Pringles will come with one plastic in each Pringles in the future in the United States because uh, people I, I don't know why they want it, and and in, in this aspect you're right. But I, as I point as and as I like to think it's a revolution and revolution takes time and revolutions go forward and and, and come back. Uh, Vincent exposed the, the the Paris Agreement is is from 2015, so we we have six years. Uh, it's 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 recent. It's 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 really recent. Uh, we 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 like to think it's oh it's already six years. Uh, I I like to think the different way because. Uh, I understand usually as lawyers, lawyers, uh, six years is, is, is a lot of time, but for government, six years is nothing. Like six years is, is one term, uh, one term and a half of, of a, a politician. And if you see an, econo an economic revolution or economic uh, growth, if you take the, the most used examples like China, uh, Japan, Korea, if we talk about uh, growth, not, not green growth, just growth. Uh, it takes 30 years uh, uh, and for a country to Japan to from a poor, destroyed country after the World War II to become an international, uh, the second biggest economy in the world. Japan took 30 years. Korea, the same thing. And Japan is taking and, and China is taking the same. So I, I think Vincent, is, he works more as a government in an in international uh, arena. Six years is nothing. Uh, that, that's my that's my whole point of view uh, for, for everything. And I, using back the, the example of cryptocurrency, yeah, they started in two thousand nine, and we're still discussing. So uh, I don't know, Vincent. What what do you think? You think six years is a long period of time, or it's a short well, period of time for? Uh, yeah, that things things indicate. No, no. Uh, you know, you're you're right. Uh, uh, look at it this way: the Paris Agreement. Uh, we agreed to it in 2015, entered into force in 2016, but, and here's the but, the implementing rules for that was agreed only in uh, 2018 and 2019, which means governments have, have actually not yet started implementing the Paris Agreement. The first year of full implementation of the Paris Agreement is actually this year. So it, it took us, uh, you know, uh, that long period of time just to negotiate after the negotiations. Um, so, and and then this is also a, a a problem in the sense that, um, in the sense that the first set of uh, what they call nationally determined contributions, right, under the Paris Agreement, um, um, enter into force or start being implemented this year, 2021, because you had a previous set of commitments already that was supposed to have ended last year. Um, so 2021 to 2030. And now a problem here as a global community is that the IPCC, the scientists, and I think Pierre was pointing this out, uh, you know, we have to listen to the scientists too. The scientists are all telling us that if we want to uh, have at least a two thirds chance, you know, 66% chance of uh, being able to hand off to our grandchildren and great grandchildren, a world that is still livable for human beings by the end of this century, we have roughly 20 years between now and 2040 in which to make sure that we drop global emissions to such an extent that we are able to keep the rise in temperature to not more than 1.5 degrees by the end of this century. And so that is a very, very, uh, 20 years might sound long, uh, but you know, when I, but when I was finishing my uh, LLM uh, 20, 21 years ago, you know, I would not have thought that, you know, 2021 is, just around the corner, but looking back over the past 20 years, it's actually just around the corner, right? So in terms of the global community, in terms of what we do as individuals and what we hope governments will do as governments and what we hope, you know, the international organizations and all of us do together, 
on climate change, for example, um, we have barely just, you know, uh, 10 to 15 years of our current lifetimes in which to do these things. Uh, and that means uh, that, you know, markets have to switch fast. That might mean that we have to look uh, closely at top-down regulation plus incentives. We have to look at how uh, individuals react. And we have to look at how people can react in different ways, give, depending on how on where they are in the world. Uh, because, you know, people who are well off in Norway or in the UK or in France or in the US will be able to react and will have less vulnerability to climate impacts compared to the, you know, the, the you know, uh, people who live in Brazil or in Peru or in the Philippines, particularly the poor in our countries, right? And with even within countries, the rich and the elites uh, who live in uh, the big cities of uh, the developing world are likely to have a different level of vulnerability compared to the poor people who live on the sea coasts and the upland areas in our countries as well. So all of this will have to be thrown into the mix. And what that policy will eventually emerge, uh, that will eventually emerge within the next five to 10 years is going to be something that will be really interesting to look at. Um, because uh, whether we like it or not, uh, we are in a crisis situation. The pandemic just highlighted how much of a systemic crisis this is uh, in terms of inequality. And therefore, uh, you know, it's not just a top-down solution that we have to look for. It's also a bottom-up solution that we have to look for and a solution that's somewhere in the middle, right? Uh, and I don't know what that is, honestly. Uh, you know. Uh, it will have to take all of our brains to to uh, think about what that is. Uh, and what that is, is also going to be different for each and every country, because what will work in Brazil uh, might not work in Peru. Uh, what works in the U.S. might not work in France. You know? So, and it, that will really have to be national decision making that will take place. Thanks. And, 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 and even though, and, and also, uh, now the pandemic, um, it's, it's putting us in a very difficult situation because you, Enrique, mentioned that everybody wants to have plastic and not everybody. Uh, but because of the pandemic and, and, all this, uh, and all this crisis globally, we're using more uh, plastic and we're producing more waste. So rather than moving, fo moving forward these objectives or these goals, we're kind of behind or or not in on track as we wanted to to be. So this put us as a, a different challenge. And and, and Nadia was um was about um to to add to to talk uh, also. So I really want to to give her, her some some minutes before I think Anna wants to to speak after her. No, okay. So Nadia, please, uh, if you I'll, want to add something, I, I'll just uh, I just want to add a few things. I, I promised myself that I was not going to be pessimistic. Uh, unfortunately, I think that the only way to sometimes change the course of humanity is to actually drive the pessimism uh, a little bit harder. Um, when scientists say that you know one degree of extra heat on this planet, this planet rises by one degree, it's going to cause cause X Y Z amount of, of devastation. To the average human, one degree doesn't mean very much. I don't think that they realize that one degree, we're talking about a planetary one degree shift rather than, you know, one degree here. Okay, so today it's 25, tomorrow it'll be 26, and eh, no big deal. I can deal with that. We do not emphasize enough the damage that has already been done to our planet and Yes, I was. I am guilty of having shown you photographs from our plan of our planet from space, which really do demonstrate how, in the global scheme of things, in the universal scheme of things, we're but a tiny little speck, a tiny speck. But the human being on this planet is the most active, and perhaps the greatest that has. Uh, of, a, of an influence on the planet and for all of humanity, not just for humanity, because that would be very hubristic, 
but for all other species on this on this earth. We have to change our ways. We have to start now. We're already too late. I don't think we have 10 or 20 years. That may be sort of a projection that, you know, someone might be able to accept. In my view, having gone through a very active, ecologically, you know, um, uh, aware period of the 1970s, we're running out of time. We're definitely out of time. I, I'd like to be hopeful that conversations like this that the Berkeley Global Society has organized will have an impact worldwide. I think that we can by continually coming back to this. Um, you've done a very good job. This was a very interesting conversation and thank you for having me. So uh, I'm sorry and, and I will use my, my privilege one last time. Nadia, about about the timing, uh, I was I was thinking when I was uh, when I was uh, uh, listening, Enrique and, and Enrique. I'm not putting you in the case of financial and banking people, but what I also do believe, we all have a different perspective. When you are talking with the people involved in the tech, they will tell you that they don't know what will happen in the next two years about the next phone, about the space innovation. So it's about the timing. Uh, we all have our own our own space, our own environment. As we were saying, Vicente, it's about contingencies. Each state also has its, its own way to, to, to work. So, so uh, Nadia, how, how can you work on it? Is it about education? Is it about just, just to push people? What, what do you propose? I know you don't have a crystal ball, but what, what could be some, some ideas? I, I think you, you got a spot on. It is education. And we bring it into the schools. We start teaching our children, our grandchildren. You, you have to continually have that. Here is the earth. This is what it's made of. It's take your kids into the woods for hikes. Um, we live out in the country, deliberately lived out in the country because I didn't want to be in the city. It was just, you know, you, you feel crammed. You feel, although I grew up in the city, but as I said the other day, we have 25 hectares of land behind me, and it's and it's uh, just bush. It's really we reforested 17 acres. I have my daily fights with the beavers that build dams, and you know, as much as I may complain about them, I love these creatures because they do help uh, protect wetlands. Education, it has to start very early. You have to teach every single human again every single year how to respect what we have around us, how to respect our neighbors, how to respect the only planet. This is our only home. We are looking for exoplanets, but they are light years away. We have identified hundreds of them, perhaps even thousands, I could be very wrong, uh, but they are very far away. And we are not about to hop on you know, a starship and zip off to another planet to, to start over. Education. It is educating our children, educating the politicians, educating local government, and pressing local government for local solutions. Um, mass transit, good, efficient mass transit that is affordable is better than millions of cars on the road. Step by step, a little bit at a time, and I think we may be able to achieve a sort of a stasis in the planet's uh, atmosphere and the stasis in the climate, and perhaps begin, not reverse, but just begin the process of reversal and regeneration. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Maria <laughs> or Anna? I was, I was reading just a comment. Um... Uh, from Vin Vicente, I don't know if you want to add something or, or Pierre wants, or Anna wants to add something to the discussion uh, just to, to wrap up uh, all the ideas after, after you. Well, I could, I could take a quick, quick shot and you know, just, just say thanks again for, for inviting me here. Um, one of the things that uh, I've learned um, when I started out as a lawyer, I was uh, an NGO lawyer. Uh, this was what almost 30 years ago, uh, and my primary work was to uh, do field work, 
uh, and do community organizing with indigenous communities in the Philippines. And um, I think um, one of the, 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 the best things I've learned, which sort of like I've kept all throughout my professional life and, and this what, what Nadja said really resonated with me uh, was, was, you know, um, respecting the beauty of the wild, right? Uh, because we often, too often think that um, development uh, and, and sort of like, you know, uh, is, is, is also about, you know, all of these gadgets and, and, and technologies that we have. But at the end of the day, it's really about what is our individual and social societal relationship with nature and uh, the, the, the ecosystem that sustains us. And this was brought home to me quite early in my professional career when I started working with indigenous communities. I mean, to, to um, help, you know, to, to work with, with community leaders, you know, I would have to leave Manila, uh, take, a, you know, a 12 hour rickety bus ride out into the, the uh, rural, the, the mountains, and then take a, a day's uh, you know, voyage upriver through thick jungle just to be able to get to the community. And I think uh, there, one of the um, uh, key questions that we often encounter from them is um, what, you know, is, is that sort of like the, the, the happiness of being, uh, uh, of, of uh, knowing that you respect nature and that you respect uh, your boundaries as a human being within a, a natural context um, uh, is, is, is very much uh, shaped by the experiences you have within the community that you have or that, that you live in. And so I think, you know, what, what Nadia was pointing out is, is crucial. You know, if we are able to educate uh, young generations and future generations and present generations about uh, the, the value uh, and why we cannot survive as a civilization if we destroy the only home that we have, um, you know, maybe that could change. It's, it's just that we need to, uh, uh, and, and perhaps the, the key thing that we really need to have is just to zero in on what that narrative is. Because all too often, the, the narrative that we have gets submerged, you know, that, that narrative of respect for nature, of what it provides to us as human beings and as a human civilization, um, that narrative gets submerged by all of the uh, technology that we have around us. You know, we don't see nature because we've overlaid asphalt or concrete over it. We don't see, na see nature because we uh, zip through it on cars instead of walking through it through the forest. And I think that is, uh, you know, something that we can do individually if you have forests. Uh, if you don't have forests, you know, go out to the desert. It's still life, right? If you don't have a desert, maybe go down to the sea. That's still life out there. At the end of it all, I think, you know, the, the key narrative is respect life because life is what sustains us. And life is not just us as living human beings, but life is about you know, this whole continuity and continuum of the ecosystems that we live in. So maybe I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, um, well, thank you for sharing your views, um, your insights, and your, um, these ideas, and for making us to, to think a little bit more about this topic. Um, I will, um, now, Alex, do you want to wrap up uh, the, the ideas of the event, please? Thank you so much for that, um, Maria, um, for that great moderation. And thank you for all of our um, speakers today who shared their ideas, as well as Nadia, who was joining us in the um, panel. I guess uh, what we've been seeing consistently in all three webinars is a common theme of we are really running out of time. And um, we've repeated that so many times across 
um, all these um, webinar conversations. And also a common theme that we've been seeing through all our conversations is that it there is no one sector that can change this. It will need a multi-sectoral approach. It will need the government, the private sector, and even individuals for all of us to be able to pitch in to really provide an environmental solution. So again, thank you to everyone for joining us in the last webinar of Berkeley Global Society's Green Week, as well as everyone who joined us for the whole week. Special thank you to Maria for being our moderator. And of course, every person that was in our um, panel today and in the whole week for sharing their time and knowledge and of course for the audience as well for a very lively discussion um, that wraps this wraps up the 